Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast, in particular, The War at uh, thewar.greatdetectives.net. It's a podcast that goes through World War II through a wide variety of different programs, including music, comedy, drama, and news. And we start with the pre-war era and go all the way through the war into the post-war era. It's quite a journey. I enjoyed taking it, and I would welcome you to listen as well. Check it out at thewar.greatdetectives.net. Well, with this episode, I'm beginning a series of 14, maybe 15, probably 14, episodes that are being pre-recorded in advance. So if you had comments on recent episodes of Johnny Dollar or other series, I won't be able to interact with those comments. Also, when I thank Patreon supporters of the day, it's possible that some of the supporters I thank may no longer be Patreons or may have changed their support level one way or another. I apologize in advance. The first uh, episode in this series I'm recording on September the 13th of 2022 for later airing. And I'm getting an early start because uh, Andrew needed me to record ahead for a week and so um, I can get started and get the first three done and I'm hoping to Uh, be able to do one or two episodes here and there, particularly around the fact that I have extra episodes to record, so I don't end up, you know, recording a crazy amount of episodes. Uh, During our paternity leave recording, I ended up recording, in some cases, five or six extra episodes a week, so trying to avoid that, but uh, may be a little out of date in cases, And I will say, because of the nature of the Johnny Dollar split, our leave episodes are going to be a bit uneven. Uh, Tomorrow's episode, for example, will have been recorded uh, with a mostly normal schedule. Also, if you do have any technical issues, uh, please email andrew at greatdetectives.net. I'm going to be out of reach for a lot of this stuff, and I'll have details on what's going on when I get back. Though, I, I should say, nothing to worry about. All good, and all, you know, just very well planned in advance. So now, with that mystery in place, let's go ahead and listen to today's mystery, which uh, will have have us starting out a uh, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar serial. The original air dates, December the 5th and December the 6th, 1955. And it's The Cronin Matter, Parts 1 and 2. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Parker, Johnny, Shorty Mutual. Oh, hi, Joe. What's on your mind? A gorgeous doll named Dolly McLean. Remember her? Sure. The Champagne Dream Girl. Yeah. Dancing darling of the Roaring Twenties. Uh, finally married Barnaby Cronin, didn't she? Right. And for a wedding present, he bought her the Circle of Fire. Oh, yeah. One of the five most beautiful necklaces in the world. Diamonds and emeralds. Worth a half a million. It's been lying in a bank vault for the last ten years since Barnaby died. We carry the insurance. So? She's coming out of seclusion, Johnny, giving a party. Just like the old days, she says. May go on for a week. The last fling. And she's going to wear the circle of fire. Uh Uh-oh. Get the picture? Gallons of champagne, everything mixed up, crazy. And that old lady with a half million bucks around her neck. Target. You've got a problem, Joe. Johnny, we've got a problem. Tonight and every weekday night... Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. 
to the home office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Cronin matter. Item one, $14.80, transportation to New York and to the apartment of America's one-time dream girl. One time, a long time ago. How do you do? I'm Johnny Dollar. I believe Mrs. Cronin is expecting me. I'm Mrs. Cronin, and yes, I am expecting you. Won't you come in? Oh, thanks. I did have butlers and maids and such for years, scads of them. But since Barnaby passed away, I've just hibernated, you might say. Oh, in here, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Ten years now in this same little apartment. As you can see, I've just been living like a little mouse. That looks very comfortable. Oh, I suppose it's comfortable enough, but... Oh, Sylvia, I'd forgotten you were still here. Mm Mm-hmm. But not for long, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, no. Please stay. We'll have some tea or sherry or something as, as soon as... Oh, you two, do you know each other? No, I'm afraid we don't. Oh, but of course not. How could you? Uh, Sylvia, this is Mr. Dollar, Miss Blake. How do you do, Miss Blake? Hello. Mr. Dollar's here to talk to me about, uh, well, something or other. I'm not quite sure what, as a matter of fact. It won't take but a few minutes, if uh, Miss Blake would excuse us. Sure, go ahead. Have at it. Well, if you'll come this way, Mr. Dollar... Don't you leave now, Sylvia. Not a chance. I just spotted your bottle of tea. I'll have one or two with soda, if you don't mind. With soda? Oh, I see what you mean. You young people. In here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dollar. You by any chance, Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Why, Miss Blake? Just wondered. Well, here's looking at you. And, brother, I wouldn't be in your shoes for a million dollars. No. How about half a million? That, I'll admit, might interest me. Well, shall we... After you, Mrs. Cronin. Thank you. Wonderful girl, a born comedian. Yeah, she's a scream. What is she, an actress? Oh, no, no, she writes things for magazines and things like that. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Uh, She came to interview me one time. That's how I met her. I see. She wrote a piece about my necklace... The Circle of Fire. Sylvia Blake. Oh, sure. Articles about gems, famous stones, jewel robberies. That's her. Oh, she's fascinated by the subject. She's coming to my party. Oh. Uh, why don't you come to my party, Mr. Dollar? Fine. I'd love to. In fact, that's why I'm here. Oh? Uh, Joe Parker over at Surety Mutual is kind of worried about this party, Mrs. Cronin. He's afraid you might invite people like me. What? I mean, people you don't know. You're a detective. Um... In a way. I told Joseph how I felt about that. He's not going to send any detectives around snooping into things, spying on my guests, wearing the hats in the house. Huh? Oh, not that you're like that, of course. But it's the principle of the thing. Well, wouldn't you have a better time at your party if you knew you were safe? Mr. Dollar, it was at a party that Barnaby gave me the Circle of Fire. Our wedding reception. There were over 2,000 guests. A thousand of them invited. And we danced. Oh, we danced all night. And the necklace was beautiful. And I was beautiful. Back then. True, but... And then afterward, at four o'clock in the morning, we drove through the park in a hansom. Just the two of us. And the driver, of course. And I wore the circle. And I was safe, Mr. Dollar. I was perfectly safe. Maybe you were just lucky that night. Barnaby was so wonderful. And he could make living so wonderful. Well, I don't doubt it. He was probably a man who could manage things pretty skillfully. He was running two railroads in a bank all at the same time. Then I imagine he had no trouble arranging for your safety without even letting you know about it. You mean guards all around? It's possible. Yes, it is. He was like that. He never wanted anything to worry me. All right, Mr. Dollar. You win. Good. But it's only because of one reason. I like you, and I want you at my party. Thank you, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, you're going to love every minute of it. It's up in the Adirondacks, our old summer place. Uh, Joseph told you, I suppose. Yes, he did. Mrs. Cronin. And the people I've invited, hundreds, literally, people I knew in the old days. Of course, a lot of them won't come, but you know it was strange. So many of the letters came back undelivered. Mrs. Cronin. Oh, 
Sylvia, I didn't hear you come in. I'm the sneaky type. You've got a visitor. Says he's an old friend. Really? Well, I suppose I'd better see you. Uh, you'll excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Sure, go ahead. You and Sylvia talk to each other. I uh, brung the bottle in case you're interested. Short on the soda. Right. She's on a cloud by herself. Of course, some of the invites to the party were undelivered. Those beautiful people had a habit of dying young. Say when. When? Who's the visitor? I'll guess with you. Looks like an overgrown leprechaun. Said his name was Shorty Weber. Shorty Weber? You know him? I know of him. An old-time song and dance man, among other things. She probably worked in a show with him back in those dear dead days. Anyway, he's got an invite clutched in his sweaty little palm. Another free loader, I suppose. Aren't we all? I am, yes. Not you, though. You're working your way. Isn't that what you're doing, one way or another? Meaning? A magazine article, just in case. Written right on the spot. Attempted theft of the circle of fire. Clever jewel Why thief. do you say attempted? I'm working my way, remember? Sure, I remember. But it won't be attempted, Johnny. Somebody's going to get that necklace before the weekend is over. I'll bet on it. Would you care to name any names? Pick a name off the guest list. Any name. Suppose I pick Sylvia Blake... You're the detective. You've dug up and written up every big-time jewel theft over the last 50 years. You're bugged on the subject, obsessed with beautiful gems. Fits my personality. I'm rather beautiful, too, in a brittle and glittering sort of way. Don't you think so, Johnny? I think you work pretty hard at that tough act. Maybe. And I think you'd give your right arm to own that necklace. Going after that would really be going for the big one. Going for broke. And somebody will do it, Johnny. Wait and see. She left a few minutes later with the bottle under her arm and a chip on her shoulder. With the girl gone and the scotch gone, there seemed to be no point in me hanging around any longer. So I went looking for Mrs. Cronin to say goodbye. I didn't find her, but I did find her caller, Shorty Weber. He didn't hear me come into the room. He was too busy. He was hunched over Mrs. Cronin's writing desk going through her mail. You won't find it there, Shorty. Who's that? Hold it, Shorty. Don't try to reach for it. I, I, I wasn't going to. Honest, I wasn't. Turn around. Put your hands up against the wall. You, you got me all wrong. I okay, wasn't going to do that. Okay, relax. I, I was uh, just 38, coming... stub barrel, clip holster. Nice gun. It belongs to a friend of mine. Bad business, Shorty. An ex-con packing a gun. Oh, I guess you're Johnny Dollar. She said you was here. And I, I, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar, but you're wrong. Why, Dolly, uh, Mrs. Cronin... She's an old friend of mine. I tried to get her to marry me once over 30 years ago. A lot and can I... happen in 30 years. Does she know you've served time in prison? Yeah. She thinks I was on tour, Europe and Australia. She never reads a paper or hears anything. Don't tell her, Mr. Dollar. Please don't. You know, it's quite a coincidence, Shorty. It was Jules that time. A big affair in New Orleans. And you were hired as an entertainer. A diamond bracelet, wasn't it? And you were caught cold. It's the only time in my life I've ever done anything like that. And I went again. Not, especially not to her. Why, I, I, I'm planning to look out for it at this party. That's why I bought the gun. And is that why you were going through a mail there? Yeah. I wanted to see who was coming. I learned things while I was doing time. I know how the word gets around in a big deal like this. There's a lot of wrong guys in this world. No argument, Shorty. Yeah, well, you met her. You, you, you know how she is. She's a babe in the woods on something like this. Should my ears be burning, or is it some other babe you mean? Not for me, Dolly. You're the only babe I ever could see. Oh, Shorty, you never give up. Oh, uh, do you two know each other? Uh, not exactly, but we found we had a mutual friend. A certain state prison warden. Oh, uh, how nice. Shorty's always doing benefits at those places. Uh, Dolly, yeah, uh, yeah, that was it. He did a benefit there. Oh, well, I'll bet you weren't over big. <laughs> well, you know. You're too modest, Shorty. Why they loved him, Mrs. Cronin. Hated to let him leave. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, speaking of leaving, uh, I got a shove now. Don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> it was crazy and corny and sad. The whole idea. I guess the sadness of it hit me when I was saying goodbye to Mrs. Cronin at the door. The gaiety slipped for a moment, and suddenly she was old and tired. And at the same time, she was a scared little girl. And then she said something strange, and the shivers ran up my back. 
Do you believe in premonitions, Johnny? Well, I have a hunch now and then. Well, whatever it is, it's the reason I'm doing this, having this party. One last fling, you might say, before it's too late. Oh, come now. You're still a young woman, Mrs. Cronin. No. I'm old, Johnny. I've been old for years, since Barnaby died. We loved each other so, but that's not what I mean. I've had this premonition lately. What sort of a premonition? That something awful, something terrible is going to happen to me. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Jason Prell. Jason I Pre- manage Mrs. Cronin's trust fund. Oh, sure. We haven't met, of course, and I know that I'm overstepping the ordinary bounds of propriety, but I simply have to talk to you immediately, if possible. Well, can't it wait until train time? You're going with us up to a party in the Adirondacks, aren't you? Yes, I am, but it'll be too late then to make very much difference. Well, uh, maybe you could tell me the general idea of what you want. I wanna... understand Mrs. Cronin has authorized you to obtain the circle of fire from the bank and to keep it in your possession until she wears it at the party. Yeah, that's right. Don't do it. Leave the necklace where it is. Why? It's a long story, Mr. Dollar, and it goes a long way back. The whole thing is a lot more complicated than you realize. Well, I'm beginning to realize it. Just exactly what is it you're worried about? I'm worried about Mrs. Cronin's sanity. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, New York City, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin Matter. Expense account continued. Item four, a dollar and eighty cents. Taxi to the offices of the Daily Times Courier for a look at the morgue files on Mrs. Cronin. The clipping started with the year 1916, when a bright-eyed, wide-eyed kid named Dolly McLean danced her way out of the chorus lines of a two-bit musical and straight into the limelight of Broadway. One hit show after another. Hits just because she was in them. And parties, balls, social affairs. The Dancing Darling. A critic tagged her with a name in her first write-up, and the name stuck. So she danced. Danced away the mad, crazy years that followed World War I. And like everybody else, she lived it up. There were rumors of engagements, love affairs. The Baron this, count that, one after another. Shorty Weber was mentioned a few times. And Jason Prell was in from the beginning as a promoter, though, a business manager, not as a lover. Her friends were mentioned, hundreds of them. Then Barnaby Cronin came into the file. Boy wonder of the business world, the golden prince. Engagement, marriage, and Barnaby's fabulous gift to his new bride, a half-million-dollar necklace of diamonds and emeralds, the circle of fire. Then Barnaby's sudden death, Mrs. Cronin's seclusion. End of file. Expense account item five, $24.30, transportation, hotel, and incidentals. And a taxi to the railway station to find the special coach Mrs. Cronin had chartered to haul her guests to the Adirondacks and to her Roaring Twenties weekend party. I purposely got there early, but one of the guests was even earlier. Mr. Dollar, wait. Hmm? You are Mr. Dollar, aren't you? That's right, but I don't think... Prell, Jason Prell. I thought you might come down early to meet the bank messengers. Thank heaven you did. Well, I'm afraid I don't... Dollar, I've known Dolly McLean... Mrs. Cronin, for over 35 years. All that time, I've managed her business affairs, arranged her personal contacts, been like a father to her. Yeah, I've read the newspaper clippings. Well, uh, newspaper stories can be misleading sometimes. They build things up. Sensationalism. It's true, of course, that Dolly and I had some quarrels. Who doesn't? In spite of everything, I was still her best friend. Go on. I know Dolly, nor better than anybody else in the world. I know how she's gone downhill since Barnaby died, especially in the last year or so. And I know this whole idea is the worst possible thing she could do. Have you tried talking to her along that line? She won't listen. She's dead set on it. I'm hoping you can help. How? Point out to her how dangerous it is to go off into that isolated place with a piece of jewelry as valuable as a circle of fire. It's worth a fortune. Somebody's bound to try to steal it. I still don't get what you're driving at, Mr. Prell. But I just told you. It's the risk that's involved. To whom? 
Mrs. Cronin, of course. She knows about the risk. She's willing to take it. She doesn't know what she's doing. Hey, you said something on the phone about her sanity. Are you trying to imply that no, she's... No, 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 no. Not, not yet. But she's not well. She's burned herself up back in those early years. And she hasn't much left. The only thing that keeps her going is... has a crazy kind of belief. Belief? Dolly believes in people. So do I, Mr. Pro. Well, yes, yes, of course. But Dolly's whole thinking hinges on it. All the people she knew back in the heyday, the people she calls her friends, in her book, they can do no wrong. She lived in a dream world, still does, like a fairy princess. But it never really existed. Things weren't like that back in those days, Mr. Dollar. So I've heard. Most of the people she thought of as friends were only trying to use her. Barnaby and I would block them off take care of things when things had to be done and let her go on living happily in her never-never land. And now, that's the only land she has to live in. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Why, some of those friends would cut their mother's throat for a tenth of the value of the circle of fire. Those are the guests she'll have at their party. Well, I've already been told once that somebody will steal that necklace before the weekend is over. Do you want to add your prediction? I think somebody will try. And that's all that's needed to start that dream world of hers falling apart. And to make her face things the way they are. May I ask you a question, Mr. Prell? Oh, yes, of course. This trust fund you're managing that her husband left for her, just how big is the setup? Barnaby Cronin was a wealthy man, Mr. Dollar, but he had his ups and downs like every business investor. The capital is adequate for her support, but not much more. Is the necklace a part of the trust capital? It's her own personal property. Otherwise, I could have prevented it from being taken from the bank. You have complete control of the trust, then? Yes. Barnaby knew that she had no understanding of business matters. I see. She's old, Mr. Dollar. Older than her years. Tired. All that keeps her alive is her belief in the past. Yeah. Her dream world. Where everybody loves her and protects her. Where she's still a dancing darling. And if that dream world is destroyed, she'll be destroyed along with it. Now phone the bank, Mr. Dollar. Ask them not to bring that necklace here. I'm afraid they think I was crazy. Why? Because I've got it with me, Mr. Prell. I picked it up myself two hours ago. Then heaven help us all. The convention coach Mrs. Cronin had charted for the run to the Adirondacks was arranged with a long aisle of individual staterooms and a main lounge area at one end. It could accommodate 50 people. But when the train pulled out, there were only six of us in the coach. Six. Out of the hundreds of friends she'd had in the old days when she was in the big time and on top. And even out of the six, three of us were new acquaintances, people who hadn't known her back when. I was there, of course, because I'd been hired to be there to protect her fabulous necklace. And Sylvia Blake, still playing it tough and cynical, was probably hoping for a magazine article, or hoping for something. But the third newcomer, there was the question mark. It's just too exciting for words. Don't you think it's too exciting for words? Well, I... Uh... I know who you are, of course. You're Mr. Johnny Dollar, and you're supposed to protect those fabulous jewels. And I'm Laura Dean, and I think we ought to call each other Laura and Johnny, because after all, it's a party, isn't it? Up till now, I was having doubts. You're, uh, obviously not one of Mrs. Cronin's friends from the old days. Oh, no, I just met her back there at the station. You what? Well, I talked to her on the phone, of course. She sent an invitation to my aunt, who was a very dear friend of hers. Only they hadn't seen each other for years, and she didn't know my aunt had passed on over a year ago. So I phoned her and told her. Told Mrs. Cronin, I mean. And she said for me to come to the party, she'd like to meet me. And I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Yeah, well, uh... Johnny, do you think they'll really have champagne in bathtubs like they used to back in her time? If they do, it'll get awful wet out. There are only six of us to drink it. Oh, gosh, I don't see how you can call six people a party. Well, the thing is, we'll all be in there trying hard. <laughs> now you're joking me. I'll bet you're fun at a party. Oh, wait till you see the act I do with a lampshade. Who did you say your aunt was? I don't think I said who. When do they start serving the champagne, Johnny? When they see the whites of your eyes. <laughs> That's cute. I like that. Thanks. Now, about your aunt. Poor old soul. She'd have loved this, too. You ought to hear about some of the parties she and Mrs. Cronin used to go to. Yeah, I imagine. They well, used to go every place together back in those days. The newspapers called them the Siamese Twins. The Siamese... Siamese Twins. That was just an expression. Fritzy like... Morell. Is that what you're saying? That you're Fritzy Morell's niece? Sure. Did you know her, Johnny? No, I never met her. Oh, you'd have liked her. She was a lot of fun. Loved a party. Gosh, I thought there were more people than this. Have... She kept babbling on, and I listened to her and tried to figure her out. The chatter was smokescreen. Underneath it, she was cool, sharp, and shrewd. I didn't know what she was up to, nor why she was here. 
But I did know one thing. Fritzy Morell had died about a year ago, true enough. But she'd left no surviving family and no niece. Laura Dean was a liar. I hadn't seen Mrs. Cronin since we pulled out of the station. She'd greeted us, then gone right to her stateroom and stayed there. And when I saw Jason Prell come hurrying from that direction, I could read the look on his face even before he reached me. Mr. Dollar, please. Mrs. Cronin? Yes, go to her at once. What is it? What's wrong? She was suddenly taken ill, very ill. Hurry. Mrs. Cronin. just nerves. I've had it before. My doctor in New York gave me some tablets to take whenever... Are these the tablets? This bottle here? Yes. You know what they are, Johnny? Uh, yeah, I know. All right. So he does say it's my heart. But he's wrong. It's just nerves. Yeah, sure. That's not why I sent for you, Johnny. You have the necklace. Yeah, Want to see it? No. no. I'll wait until it's time to wear it. Johnny, I've written something here. Now, I'm going to sign it, and I want you to sign as a witness. Well, uh, all right. Unless you'd rather have Jason Pro. Mm, Jason would argue about it. There. Now you sign. There you are. Keep it for me. <laughs> Do you mind if I know what I've signed? Oh, of course not. Read it if you like. In the event of my death, I, Dolly Cronin, being of sound mind, bequeath the necklace known as the Circle of Fire to Sylvia Blake. Sylvia loves jewels. She'll appreciate it. Yeah, I imagine she will. She's not to know about this, you understand, because, of course, it'll be years before she gets it. Oh, sure it will. Now, you'd better try to get some sleep. I'm going to. And thanks, Johnny. It was nothing. You know something? I was heartbroken when they didn't show up at the station. All my old friends. But I've been lying here thinking, and I've finally figured it out. Oh? They all went on ahead. They'll be waiting at the house. They're trying to surprise me. Don't you think so, Johnny? I said, yes, I thought so, but I was lying because I didn't think so. But she was still a dancing darling, and she had that way about her. You wanted to protect her. I didn't go back to the lounge. I walked down the corridor to my stateroom. It was night by then, and the corridor was only dimly lit. My stateroom was dark. When I opened the door, I caught a bare flash of movement too late. Oh! came two minutes later, I was lying on my stateroom floor, blood seeping from a cut in my head. I felt in my inside pocket for the bulky leather case that had held the necklace. It was gone. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, an old love and an old hate. And violence breaks out at midnight. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
Welcome back. A very solid episode. And once again, you really do have a series taking its time, introducing its characters, building up uh, its mood and tone, and helping Johnny kind of establish a rapport with Mrs. Cronin. Now, this story is one of many works you'll hear or even, say, if you're uh, referring to television programs from the 1950s where the focus is on a character who had been a star or had in some way been connected to early film, silent film. Uh, been a star during the Roaring Twenties. And it's an interesting portrayal. Because if you do the math, Mrs. Cronin was a star, starting with her big discovery in 1916. She may have been in her late teens or early 20s. So this, uh, at this time, she would probably be in her late 50s and early or early 60s. I mean, for a comparison, think of someone who was in their 20s, early 20s in, let's say, the early 1980s and became a film star or a TV star. Now, certainly some of those actors have passed for various health reasons, but we have uh, scads of such stars around. I'm not going to name any names. Recording this seven months out, so I don't want to be ironic. But you know, there are so many stars from eras. You know, we are making sequels and follow-ups to things that were originally released in the 80s and 90s. And we've got original cast members back. So it can be a bit hard to relate to this, but they did hint at the fact that uh, a lot of people from this era really died very young uh, because there was a lot of hard living back in the Roaring Twenties. And that was definitely true of actors. They referenced that in this story, but try to be very gentle about it with references to uh, Mrs. Cronin being uh, old beyond her years. So it's not a case of radio just imagining people in their 50s and 60s as overly frail, but it's a portrayal of how different aging was for many people in years past. Well now, let's go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Lance, Patreon supporter since January of 2022. Currently supporting the program at the Master Detective level of $15 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Lance. And that will do it for today. If you're not subscribed to our podcast already, you can subscribe wherever you uh, get your podcast from, whether it's Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, or uh, Amazon Music Store. If you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back on Friday with the conclusion of this story, but join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... Overtures which I always immediately refuse. What kind of overtures do you mean? Veiled proposals made under cover, proposals that I would find it extremely beneficial financially to sell out my party. Who was making these proposals? I I could never find out who was behind them. Naturally, I would not listen to any of them. And then when this Matalla brought his absurd charge of treason against me, I concluded this was the next step in their plan. If they could not buy me out, they would discredit me. It could figure that way, all right. But it's going to be pretty tough to prove the whole deal is a frame. I do not think so, Richard. What do you mean? I am not completely without friends, both in my own and other countries. It was reported to me this morning that the man answering Matala's general description was seen in Cairo, Egypt, two days ago. What? Katouf, I did not know this. No, General. I did not wish to arouse your hopes until the rumor could be investigated. Well, I guess I'm the boy to investigate it. Cairo, huh? Yes. Mitchell, if you can find this man, perhaps if you were to offer him money, he would return and clear Katouf. 
I personally am willing to pledge any necessary amount. Yeah, if he sold out once, he probably could be talked into selling out again. But that's the trouble right now. How do you mean? Sooner or later, whoever hired him is going to realize that. They'll figure out that they don't want him running around loose. Yes, that means they will be trying to find him also, to kill him. Yeah, it also means I'd better be heading for... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.